Welcome back to the wilds of Southern Nevada, where we're playing around on Battlefield Vegas's M50. This is the core part two. If you missed part one, just go to the link below and get yourself caught up. Otherwise, onwards. And you can see I'm standing in the loader's hatch. This is a oval loader's hatch. Most of the M50s by now would have had them, although there were some M50s still were built off the line with the older split hatch if they had a hatch at all. Of course, a lot of the early 75 millimeter turrets had no loader's hatch and they created a field modification that you can install. It was a kit, basically. But loader's hatch here. Other things on the outside of the turret, well, of course, you got the French made smoke grenade launchers. If you look at the back, you're gonna see the fan housing for the ventilator in the bustle slash kernel weight, two radio antennae. On the front of the turret, your spotlight control from inside a vein sight, two machine guns. The Israelis love giving everybody machine guns. It's seen like an M5 half track with like six machine guns scattered around the outside. They don't have many men in Israel. So in order to make up the numbers a little bit, they give everybody a machine gun. Why not? So we can see here, we got a caliber 50 on the pintle front and center in between the TC and the loader. And there is a caliber 30. Uh, actually, it's a 7.62 uh, converted just for the commander. A lot of Israeli vehicles, you will sometimes see another caliber 50 mounted on the gun tube. And there is a mount just forward of the mantlet, but that is not for a caliber 50. That is for a spotlight for fighting at night. So that is basically it for the outside. Now it's time to go in. Once you get in, it's cozy, but definitely sittable. Uh, the basket does seem to be a little bit higher than other Shermans I've been in, possibly because of the large amount of underfloor stowage. I'll get back in a second. Although I do note that they were nice enough to put cushioning inside here for your head. Now, of course, you are supposed to be wearing a helmet at the same time. And the Israelis use all sorts of helmets from the American World War II style through to you'll even find some Russian style helmets. I think they were actually made in Czechoslovakia, but they're sort of the, the ribs made of uh, spongy leather. Not all M3 turrets were built with a pistol port. So if they didn't have a pistol port, one would eventually be added. And uh, yeah, it's called a pistol port. In reality, you'd be using it to flick whatever you wanted out there, such as shell casings. Back up. Come around to the left side, you see stowage for your small arms, your personal defense weapon, which of course being in Israel is an Uzi, and there's mounting points scattered around for the crew. Periscope, fully traversable and elevation. Uh, obviously a good thing if you're buttoned up. Dome light to the front, the control point for that spotlight I mentioned earlier, simple toggle switch on and off. There is a handle that you can get, it looks a bit like a 1911 handle, it's, it's old, goes back to World War II, basically. And you'll note the power connector this comes and select, uh, connects up into here. Coaxial machine gun. Uh, it is a 1919. It has been rechambered to 7.62 NATO. And this was done by the Israelis. There's Israeli uh, Hebrew markings on the side. Solenoid fired. There is a single box of ammunition directly underneath the coaxial, so it kind of goes out, around, and uh, up from the bottom left. Stowage for an additional two boxes further down underneath. Uh, actually, I think you get more than two boxes. I'm looking at it. Correction, an additional at least five boxes. And then we come around to the gun with the travel lock for elevation and the breech opening handle, massive breech opening handle. Let's bring it up around, lock it into place. Now remember, this gun was originally designed for operation with an autoloader on the MX-13. The Israelis had a look at it, and they decided though not to go with an autoloader and just keep it a manually loaded gun. Uh, unlike, let's say, the Egyptians who put the AMX-13 FL-10 turret on top of their Shermans. Ammunition scattered around. Well, depends on where you read it, looks like, because I've seen some books say 62 rounds, nine on the left, three on the basket floor, and 25 on each side under the turret basket. This tank doesn't have that, that I can see. I see stowage for five on the left, nothing on the basket, but it does retain the 
two underfloor ammo bins for 25 rounds apiece. And you can see they're not small ammo storage bins, so five across, five down on each side. So obviously you get to the ones at the far side, you got to spin the turret over the back deck. The ammunition types available were HE, AP, and APCBC. Now the latter supposedly capable of penetrating about 90 millimeters of armor, sloped to 30 degrees at 1,000 meters. The gun was theoretically capable also of firing heat and sabo. However, I haven't been able to confirm Israeli use of those types of ammunition from this gun. The ammunition is not small. So as you can see, once you pull it out, you have barely enough room to put the projectile behind the breech and to give it a good push in. Now, the recoil guard is huge, but really does not get in your way at all. So kudos to them, they designed that one well. But the gun is capable of being loaded at all elevations. It is very close, but it can be done. Uh, otherwise, it's a semi-automatic system, so you slam the round in the first time. After that, uh, every time you fire, it auto-ejects and you move, just load on to the next round. The recoil card is big, as you would imagine, but it actually doesn't interfere with the loading process at all. So I've got plenty of room for my fist to slam it in. So that's it for the loader side, really. I'll just mention the, the junction box. Looks very familiar if you're an American AFV crewman. Uh, the recoil guard folds out of the way very nicely. You just slide back. One small part folds down. The rest folds forward out of the way. Gives you a lot of room to run, wander around inside the back of the turret. So that said, next up, TC side. All right, so come over to the right-hand side of the turret. I've put the recoil guard back up just to simulate the lack of space. And the TC has two seats. He has an unbuttoned seat so he can sit comfortably uh, whilst observing the battlefield. And he has a buttoned up seat a little bit lower behind and unfortunately removed from the vehicle. Plus, I am not sitting on it. However, I will note that he doesn't actually have a whole hell of a lot of room because I'm sitting on the gunner seat, the backrest would be here. So you can see his backrest, you know, his seat is here. He only has this much room for the gunner's backrest. You've pretty much got to sort of straddle one leg each side of the gunner. And just be careful with your left leg because the recoil guard doesn't go down sufficiently far to cover it, which is probably a little bit disconcerting. As you start at the back of the turret, uh, I do note a couple of mounting points for flashlights and whatnot. The radios are mounted more or less in the same place as they always have been. The ducting for the ventilator goes to the very far back of the bustle. But you will see that the counterweight is literally a counterweight. It is solid metal and there's not much extra internal volume created by the addition on the back. Intercom set, your J-Box, uh, again, post-war American style. The cupola. So again, M50s were built with either the older split hatch cupola or the single piece direct vision cupola. The latter, of course, being far preferred. Uh, however, uh, like most late model M50s, we have the single piece cupola. But after the M50s left frontline service and they started being used as fortifications and bunkers, basically, uh, the M48s were also entering service to replace the M50s. The Israelis thought those were really, really tall vehicles. They are because they've got a big cupola, armored cupola for the caliber 50 for the TC. So these became, these single piece Sherman hatches became in high demand as the Israelis would remove the M48 cupola, replace it with the Sherman single piece. As you move a little bit further around, you have a commander's override for the power traverse. I suspect, can't confirm, but I suspect from the wiring that this is a control toggle for the spotlight, which is mounted on top of the gun. Other than that, it's a simple enough TC seat. I can't really complain about it, other than the fact that there is no legroom, uh, but it will otherwise do the job. So next we move forward to the gunner's place. Gunner's not doing too badly. Um, I mean, yeah, my legs are a little long, but that's typical for me in an older tank. Certainly, it's very fightable for me. 
So, where to start? I guess we'll start off with the gun itself. Now, it's often stated that the CN7550 is a copy of the Panther's KWK43. I have found nothing to corroborate this at all. Yes, it's a 75mm gun. So, it's the one on the original Sherman, and you know, there's obviously no cor correlation there. Uh, the chamber size is different. You cannot put German ammunition in the French gun, or vice versa. As near as we can tell, the closest it happened is that the French studied the Panther's gun, maybe got a couple of hints or tips, but otherwise it's an independent development. As you look forward, you're going to see, you know, again, several things here. So, for example, the gunner's quadrant here for indirect fire to use in conjunction with the azimuth indicator on the right. You can see the large bolts that I'd mentioned, which hold the entire gun assembly on, and you can look through and you can see the trunnions well forward uh, on either side of the gun, and you can you can see the the way that the mantlet is configured. There would ordinarily be a telescopic sight here. It has been removed from the vehicle, unfortunately. We don't know why. Curse whoever that was. But you will also note that they have modified the gunner's periscope to have the connecting rod go through the original mantlet port to connect to the main gun. So it is also still possible to fire the main and coaxial ammunition by use of the periscope, which has a unity optic on the left-hand side and a small telescope on the right-hand side. So you can head forward, you can fully see with all of the advantages that you get of a periscopic sight that you can observe without being so obvious, unlike a telescopic sight where you have to expose most of your turret in order to see anything. He has a junction box of its own. Once the traverse lock is released, traverse is conducted either by manual traverse in the traditional manner, or you disengage the clutch and there is a power traverse option by use of the handle down at the bottom. It's an oil gear power traverse system here. Just next to the uh, power traverse control handle, you're going to see the main power box. So there is a big toggle here for turret power. You can also toggle on and off the coaxial machine gun and the vents. Elevation on the left hand side is again the same sort of control handle with a clutch to select elevation with uh, manual control or power control. However, I see no indication that a stabilizer has been retained. Maybe it was and it's now no longer in the vehicle. Getting good information on an M50, at least in English, is surprisingly difficult. Other than that, again, more protection for the gunner. And uh, he just needs to be careful to remember to leave the TC enough room. But again, he's the gunner. He's going to be leaning forward and to the right. He's going to be leaning into the gunner's periscope. So he's not going to interfere with the TC quite as much as perhaps he might think. Finally, of course, the last thing you do is you fire around, which you have a couple of choices. So there's a coaxial machine gun button down by your foot. Uh, there is an electrical trigger or a... Right, normally that doesn't happen in these things. Might be a good idea to get out of here. Now, I am just skipping right over the bow gunner's position because it's a bow gunner's position. Unlike the Firefly conversions, the Israelis felt no need to dispense with the bow gun in order to allow additional ammunition. Although, as I'm looking at it, I see that the ammunition on the right hand side of the tank is actually stowed with the points facing to the rear unlike the left-hand side where it's facing forward, which actually makes a bit of sense because if you think about it, the loader has rotated 180 degrees in order to access it. However, after a few years, it was decided to cull the bow gunner's position because the Israeli army is somewhat manpower strapped and it was deemed more efficient that if you took the fifth man from four tanks, you could then man a fifth tank. So what's really more important, uh, five bow gunners or an entirely new additional tank? So that's why we're not really bothering the bow gunner's position. You've seen it before. Driver's side, again, this is a small hat Sherman. You've seen me get out of it at combat speed. It's actually not that bad to get out of. Simple, single swing over hatch, no difference at all to the Grizzly that we filmed before. Now, they changed the engine. They did not change the transmission. The transmission is still your manual transmission synchronized except for the first gear and as a recall reverse, but don't quote me on that. Left hand side, well, you got your 
control box, master power for the hull, master power for the turret, and the jump start connector, should you require a slave start. Left hand side, we note we do have a spare headlight and your dashboard, which has been suitably converted for operation with your armatures, oil pressure, oil temperature, fuel level. Your light switch are the earlier World War II, well, mid, middle World War II type, really. The, the very early ones were a, fuel, were a pull out. Fuel tank selector for your gauge, so if you know which gauge you're looking at. Panel lights as a power outlet. High water temperature, warning lights. There's only two warning lights, water temperature and oil pressure. And that's pretty much it. You come down, the seat of course will elevate and depress because you're driving head out or head down. As I'm driving head down, the periscope will be directly in front of me. There's an auxiliary periscope mounted directly to the front as well. So vision is not going to be a problem. Footrest on the left hand side, there's a, a clutch, reasonably light. No brake, of course, because the brakes are the two tillers. You pull back the two tillers and there is a foot pedal which locks them in place if you wanted to use them as a parking brake. And of course, on the right hand side is an accelerator. All right, so as I said, it's probably best we relocate before the local constabulary come to find out what that loud noise was. So to get going, we will turn on the master power to the hull. You see all the dials come to life. We have a low oil pressure light on, no surprise there. Turn on the preheater. Turn on the fuel cutoff. Down to start. Give it a bit of a prime. Let's see if that's necessary. Oh, fuel oil pressure is good. So we will ensure we are in neutral. Clutch down, and let's see what happens if I push the big red button. Time to get out of here. Well, unsurprisingly, driving a Sherman is easy. Although I was a little bit surprised I was unable to get it into third on that slide up slope and keep it there. So around 300 M50s were totally converted by the Israelis, but by 1973, they were starting to get a little bit inviable in the theater. So they started being converted to other roles, such as artillery. Not all of them though. In the late 70s, about 30 to 50 of these M50s were handed over to an Israeli-backed militia force in Lebanon, the South Lebanon Army. And that explains the 016 mark I mentioned on the bow earlier, because they all had numbers welded to the front. So a fourth army for this vehicle. By the late 80s, though, they were also returned to Israel for future use. Other vehicles saw service as fortifications. About 50 were sent to Chile, where they had their 75 millimeter guns removed and replaced by 60 millimeter high velocity guns. They also had their Cummins engines replaced by Detroit diesels. If you are wondering why we were playing with a live cannon tank, well, that's because it is the business of Battlefield Vegas to have tanks available for people to rent out and shoot live rounds. So if you're ever in the Vegas area, tell them we sent you and who knows, maybe they'll hook you up with something. So anyway, that's it, your M50. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Take care and I'll talk to you on the next one. Why is this wind suddenly coming out of nowhere? 
Just as I go. 